Copy me? Okay. Yes, I do. Good morning, okay. everyone. Good morning. So, question to the diploma section. How many of you are supposed to attend this course? Usually, uh, you're 10, and on average, five will continue on the solid earth stuff. We are just three. Okay. I see some mm, empty screen now. So I see you, Tarek. I see yeah, it's you. me. It's me. Okay. Then I see Jakubu, but you, that's free. Okay. Who is Kumsa? Do you know? He is from uh, Rwanda. Okay. Yeah. And he's supposed to attend the course because he's. He okay. Are you there? Kumsa? Uh, yeah, I'm from IFA. Okay, so <clears throat> you're, you're supposed to attend this course, right? Yes, uh, yeah, yes. Okay, yes. Good. Okay, well, uh, today it will be a really messy lecture because usually I'm using Microsoft Teams. I'm not a fan of it, but at the University of Trieste, we have to use that one, that, that platform. So I'm here using Zoom, that usually is, I was using it for fun, but okay, I, I see here that the ICTP settlement is, is very good. So, okay. Today I'm here in the Stasi room, maybe other lectures will be given from the university uh, where, it, where my office is. And uh, okay, let's spend one minute and let me introduce myself. I'm. Fabio Romanelli, I'm a seismologist uh, belonging to the Department of Mathematics and Geosciences at the University of Trieste. But since I was a kid, many years ago, I've been working with ICTP uh, as a student, as a researcher, and as a Karim's friend. Okay, all of you know Karim, right? Okay, I'm, I'm his friend, so I'm, I feel home here. And by the way, officially I belong to the university. Um, and since the ESP diploma started, I was giving two courses. And so the, the let's say, seismological matter was divided into two sections. The basic one that is in the part of wave physics course, uh, where usually I was introducing harmonic oscillators, wave systems, Starting from the wave equation, uh, in the simplest case, uh, I was speaking about acoustic waves and then seismic waves, P waves, S waves, Rayleigh waves, love waves, but no seismic sources. So it's time now to speak about sources, and that's actually a quite complicated topic, definitely. And so in this course here, it's called theoretical because it's okay that you, you would see that there will be a lot of mathematical expressions and some of them will be terrible for everyone for everyone and in a couple of lectures we should study what we call the representation theorem and that's that's it, it, how it's tough and then we have to, to speak about what is a green function but I think that and this is my, my, my question to you in, in a couple of minutes. I think that Lapo Boski uh, already introduced the Green's function. By the way, we're going to study the elasodynamics Green's function, that is another uh, important topic. And then we will go to something that is a little bit more, let's say easier, that is about the, what we call a focal mechanism. So a very simple point source representation of a seismic source. Then we will spend some time about what we can, okay, we, we can call the complex uh, part of the wave velocity. So we will speak about seismic attenuation and Q. And then in the final lectures, we're going to speak a little bit about tsunami physics and seismic and tsunami hazard, just as an introduction 
for example, to other courses, maybe the, the Stefano Parolai course, that is more about seismological practice, he is going to, to, to speak about side effects and stuff like that. But I will give to you, my intention is to provide you a sort of introduction of the seismic hazard. Uh, so this is the quick introduction from my side. And then a question to you, uh, because concerning, I'm referring to the diploma students, uh, you spent, well, the first term about basic concepts that are not so basic, but all of you attended and passed wave physics course, right? It's a silly question. Okay. And it was a beautiful course. Lapoboski is a very good theoretician. He is great. Maybe he was a little bit, uh, I have to say, not expert in providing lectures to, to diploma students, but have a very different. Uh, background, the scientific background, from pure mathematics to, to applied physics. So it's not an easy course. Also, the, the, the topics can be considered easy. So a question to you, uh, but it's a sort of a tautology or something that's not a real question. I am, I'm assuming that you know what is a wave, what is an acoustic wave, what is a P wave, what is an S wave, and what is a surface wave. Do you? Is it a yes? It is a no? It is a quantum mechanics uh, yes, answer? Yes. yes. Okay. It's a yes. Um, and Maria Aurora, I assume that you know what is a, a P wave, for example. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Because those topics are, are supposed to be, to, be, to be already covered in, in, a, in a previous course. Okay, by the way, so let me ask you, uh, Tarek, you're on, on my left of, of my screen. What is a P wave? Please so, feel free to say whatever. Okay. Okay, okay. So uh, a P wave is what we call um, a body wave. Yep. Is one of a body wave. Uh, and the uh, it's trouble. It's traveling by compression dilatation, compression dilatation of a volume. So it's, it's it is traveling um, uh, parallel to the wave. Uh, it's the P wave is traveling. I'm going to call Lapoboski now. He's <laughs> getting lower. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, maybe what you are trying to say is that it is. A longitudinal wave. Longitudinal, yeah. This is the okay. word that I was searching about. Okay, good, good, good. But please feel free to, to say whatever. Um, okay, and just okay. It's one of the body waves. What is the other body wave? The S wave. Okay, and which adjective would you use instead of longitudinal? Transversal. Good, <laughs> because the perturbation that is traveling, because the wave is the perturbation, it's not a ray. Please remember that a wave is a wave field. It's not a ray. A ray is, is a visualization of a direction of propagation, and it is transverse, and it's slower, and the velocity depends on mu, on the rigidity modulus, and not from the bulk modulus, and so on. Okay, now, Adding boundary conditions, like the a free surface, you will get surface waves. And you will get what we can call dispersion. OK? Now, question, but it's a friendly question. Dumbu, what is dispersion? Feel free to say whatever. I, I cannot hear you. Please use some acoustic waves that are going to, to be okay. Please, do you say uh, so we wait? So we wait, uh, cover relay way and left ways. No, but my question is simpler what is dispersion? Dispersion or balsamic waves? Dispersion in general, like with the rainbow. If you 
it's going to rain and then the sun appears, you will get a rainbow. Yeah. And what is dispersion in general? The propagation comes from with different phases, type of phases. Each type of body waves inside of the of the wave field propagate with different type of frequency, with different type of phases in the subsurface. Of phases? Yeah, uh, yes, I think so. Oh. Well, that's a consequence of the fact that Phase velocity, or if you want, velocity, depends on frequency. And to have dispersion, you need some, well, for example, you need a discrete system. Because, for example, if you're going to study uh, propagation of vibrations in lattices, you will get dispersion. But it's not the dispersion that we're going to study in seismology because we are using continuum mechanics, of course. And so dispersion should have another nature. The example of the rainbow is that dispersion is called intrinsic. Uh oh, OK. No, someone is disappearing here. Uh, intrinsic dispersion means that the wave propagation, the velocity of the wave propagation, depends upon frequency in an intrinsic fashion like light when it's not in vacuum. If you put light in water, in a glass, in the atmosphere, whatever, then velocity depends upon frequency. And you can separate, for example, the visible spectrum from red to violet or infrared and ultraviolet, different velocities, and you can get the rainbow. Now, in seismology, the dispersion that you Maybe you have already studied in the wave physics course is different because it's due not to, to an intrinsic fashion, but it's due to the boundary conditions. So the existence of a free surface and the layering will cause the existence of log waves and dispersion. But please remember that in a homogeneous half space with a free surface, you can get Rayleigh waves, but they are not dispersed in principle, unless you invoke an elasticity. Because one of the effects that we will see in an elasticity is that we will get dispersion. So that was another basic uh, concept that I hope it's in your pocket. Uh, and we're going to spend some time about it. Uh, another question. Um, I'm sure that during the wave physics course, you solved some wave equation problem with some boundary conditions. Okay? Now, as far, well, as I presume, you have not spoken about a seismic source. And if you do it, maybe you use uh, a very simple source, like a point source. Am I right? It, it just a, a, a checkpoint, just to, to understand how to start. And don't worry, today we will start just with an introduction with some movies, hoping that my, my gadgets here, I have too many gadgets on my desk, are going to work. So we will start from scratch. but. It just, um, my questions here are just to, to check the common background, okay? Um, so let me ask you another thing. Mm. Jakubu, for example, a question to you. If you, let's imagine that you have to define a love way. What would you say? Um, love wave, they are surface wave that, that travel along the surface. Oh, uh, and they are. Wait, 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 wait. There are some cases in which you may have low velocity channels deeper in the deep structure, and the low velocity channel will trap surface waves there. 
So you're right, they are surface waves. Generally, they travel at the surface because they decay with depth in the house space. But remember, the nature is a little bit trickier than the simple assumption. But you're right, they are surface waves. They exist due to the boundary condition of a free surface. And if you want to describe love waves, you need at least one layer, you know. And that layer needs to be, needs to be, help me, Jacobo, please help Homogeneous. Me. Well, a layer is supposed to be homogeneous, but it has to be a low velocity layer over an half space, which velocity has to be larger. Because otherwise, the, all the refractions and reflections will cause the energy to be leaked in the half space. So, Rayleigh waves exist whenever you have a free surface. But to have, how to say, constructive interference of phases building a love wave, you need at least one low velocity layer over half space. And you get dispersion and you have the modes. Okay? Good. Uh, another question, maybe to you, Jacobo. But it's a simple question. Have you discussed with Lapoboski the three modes of the Earth? Yes. Uh, in spherical middle, geometry. Yes, middle, some overtones. And... OK, OK, good. So um, because I know Lapo is one of, he's, he's a really an expert about the modes of the Earth. And so you discussed the difference between the modes in a flat reference system compared to a spherical and finite system, right? Remember, the Earth, oh well, okay, the Earth is not a sphere. No, it's not. It's an oblate spheroid, but okay, you, we can approximate. It's not homogeneous. It's beautiful, it's, uh, the radius is uh, 6,371 kilometers, but it's finite, it's a sphere. Uh, well, it's not a sphere, okay. But when we use a flat reference model, you don't see the end of a model. Okay, let me use the, I love the blackboard. I have also a whiteboard here, but. Yeah, hello. The network, the network um, fits so I can do it. Okay, let me find the chalk here. No chalk. Oh, yes. Do you see the, the blackboard? Yes. yes. Okay. Usually, this is a flat X, Z, and Y is getting out from the blackboard, okay? Now, we can use this as a model of the Earth. We can do it. But remember, it's valid only at a local scale. Because if you continue, so the X has no end, and you can write, usually, when you write a plane wave, you use this of this frequency wave number and so on, right this is a plane wave traveling along x but x has no end it's infinite but if you go on a global scale the earth is finite and so the modes of a layered system in a plane geometry are different than the modes of the Earth. You can call this the core mental boundary and whatever. These modes 
are different than these modes. So please, you should know that love waves become torsional or toroidal modes in a spherical system. So love waves are pure SH waves. Rayleigh waves are PSB waves, as you know. You should know this, right? OK, good. So if this is love, and this is Rayleigh, when you go on a sphere, they become torsional and spheroidal modes, and situation is different. OK? OK, the key point to describe a wave, as you know, is omega and k. Because here, you have the frequency of a wave. Here, you have the wave number. And k contains the wavelength, right? You know this. Yes. 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 It, it's just a recap. OK, now, when omega and k are not related by a simple line, If you have a line in the omega k plane, that's velocity. Please, if you have to remember one expression that is a trivial expression, the wavelength is the product of the velocity and the period, right? So now, if you take You get immediately this. It's the same. So velocity is the ratio between omega and k. And when in the omega k plane you have a, a straight line, the slope of the straight line is giving to you the velocity. And now you see also the definition of dispersion. Because if the slope of a curve in the omega k plane is a straight line, you have no dispersion. Because all the frequencies, all the frequencies have exactly the same velocity. But whenever the curve is not a line. Now, if the slope is not a line, then you have dispersion. And immediately, and you have a different velocity. Because one thing is the ratio, and one thing is the slope. And it is different. This is called phase velocity. This is called group velocity. So whenever you have a line, a curve, in the omega k plane that is not a line, you have dispersion. OK. So this was a part of a recap of some words that I'm going to use later in the course, especially when we are going to discuss uh, unelasticity, because we will make that plane complex. So this was one part of the recap. And now let me 
in this first and messy lecture of today, messy because it's my fault, um, let me show to you also the, the website where you can find, it's a Moodle website, I'm using the Moodle of ICTP, but uh, Maria Aurora, if you cannot access it, um, I created a sort of a, of a copy of it on the Moodle of Unity S where you can access it. That By the way, okay, so let me share my screen now because I'm going to show to you, oh God. Okay. I guess that you see it, right? Instead of a blackboard, now you should see a web page. Yes. Copy that? Okay, good. Yes. yes. Now, you see the, the website here? It's, okay. It's inside the Moodle. It's not used too much by other people, but okay, it's time to start. Okay, so you see it. I, according to my privileges in administrating this page here, I let the guest access on. So you should be able to access it. Definitely, because I'm using it since more than, no, well, okay, let's say 10 years, because um, from the ICPP campus, you should be able to access it. It's free. You see the, the course identities, in this case, it's 24. Sorry. And here you see... Sorry, so can you put a uh, website on the charts? You see it? See. The, the link, Professor. Link. Can you send the oh, link? Yeah. Okay, the okay, 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 okay. Wait a second. Um, I collected from Patricia uh, your emails, but still, uh, okay, let's make Vice versa. Um, I have uh, Maria Aurora's email, but yeah. I'm not. I, I have ten emails of of you, but not you five uh, that are supposed to attend this course. So let me put in this way: uh, please write me an email, and I will reply with the link. Now your question should be: Okay, what about my email? And now I'm going to try to to share just a second. Um, my Mac, where I have some animations, but okay, let me first conclude with this, and then I will give to you the link. Um, here you have a collection of the PDF of the, let's say, of the slides that I'm going to share with you in this course, okay? Um, in the first lecture, the, the one that we're supposed to take today, uh, there are some movies, but it's just an introduction. So in the PDF, I, I cannot put a movie, of course. But then you see the PDF of the other lectures that we are going to, to discuss together. And here is the collection updated to, OK, let's say one year ago, approximately. If I'm going to change something, I'm going, of course, to update these files. But here, at least now, you should be able to see the topics that we are supposed to cover during this not so easy course. Okay, so this is the introduction. We are going to spend one lecture, but uh, actually it's just a sort of a tunnel to the course that you should take with Karim. Uh, I think he's going to start in just some days, in some weeks, about, um, let's call it, earthquake mechanics. And that part is about dynamics. So the study of the forces that are generating earthquakes. But after this, let's say, um, short lecture about dynamics, then we will take a kinematic route. And we will try to study the kinematics of an earthquake. And to do that, we will try to study what is called the representation theorem. And it's a very important topic. It's not an easy topic. Um, you will see a lot of 
formulas there. And let me tell you just today, today, and I will say it again, I don't want you to memorize expression. You can do that. But my goal is to show to you the logic that is behind the expressions, OK? So it will be a, a tough lecture, but we will try not to get lost into algebra, but just to keep an eye to our target. And our target is to have something that we can use to represent an earthquake. And to use means that we will insert the term of a source inside the wave equation. And to do that, we will need to discuss or to rediscuss, if you already considered that, what is the elastodynamic Green's function. And that will be another tough topic because algebra will be there, but we will discover something that is very important also for the course that you're going to take with Alessandra Borghi about GPS. Well, I call it GPS, but it's not uh, proper. Let's say to study deformation using satellites. Because a signature of an earthquake is left there. And when we will study the Green's function, we will call it near field term. It's very important. Then, assuming two conditions that are called point source approximation and far field approximation, we will study a nice and relaxing topic that is called focal mechanism, or using a seismological slang, beach balls. So whenever you have um, an earthquake, you can represent it with a beach ball that is showing to you the mechanism that is in the point source approximation that is responsible for the radiation of seismic waves. OK, then we will take a very uh, quick detour to some basic principles of seismometry. Uh, well, this is called theoretical seismology. So we will not see in practice what is a seismometer. You can ask Stefano Parolai about that. But just to have a, a principle in mind, because using seismometers, in 1930, Charles Richter decided to define earthquake magnitude. So really to understand what is a magnitude, we will need to, all the theory that we're going to cover until this point, and to understand that, let me try to move this. How to, okay, I'm not able. Okay, let me bypass it. Okay, you see here. And because Charles Richter, of course, he was totally aware that he was using a specific seismometer, a Wood Anderson seismometer, that has a response function. So the early definition of magnitude, we can call it well, we have to call it Richter's magnitude, is coming from a beautiful idea, very simple, and then a specific instrument. Then at the end of the, of the lecture, we're going to define what is the most used magnitude today, that is called moment magnitude, or MW. And to understand MW, we will need to go back and use the representation theorem, because we will use what we call the moment tensor. A moment magnitude that is very simple in principle. Actually, it's tricky when you define it in practice. And we will see that effect with a beautiful paper that sets time and the mill ocal um, to beautiful seismologists, and both of them visited ICTP different times, of course, but, um, and they produced a very nice paper in March uh, 25, and so 2005, and 
we can use all the theory, the simple part of a theory that we are supposed to discover in this course to understand what is moment magnitude. Okay, then at the end of the course, we're going to spend uh, one lecture, a little bit more, um, speaking about unelasticity. And we will invoke some viscoelastic basic principles to understand what is the Q of the Earth. And that's a different topic. Then at the end, we will try to gather all this information and we will assume a different point of view, the point of view of, okay, given this knowledge, can we assess hazard with seismic in front of it? So seismic hazard. But then in the final lecture, we will spend some time trying to understand the basic physics of tsunamis that are not seismic waves, they are gravity waves. Usually they are studied in fluid dynamics, not the tsunami, but uh, gravity waves. And instead of looking at the beautiful sea in front of Trieste with wind waves, we will try to understand that gravity waves can be excited also by um, a giant earthquake or a mega earthquake with uh, not so beautiful effects and trying to understand some basic tsunami physics, we will also speak about tsunami hazard. So this is the work plan of a course. It's not an easy course. It's supposed to restart from where you left uh, in the wave physics course and to complete it in the sense that we have to take the wave equation and to insert a source term. So in practice, what you can find here are the PDF version of the slides that we will discuss together. And since in the first lecture, we are supposed to, dis to discuss also some practicalities, um, let me tell you, these slides are enough for the exam. Because one question from you will be about the exam. Okay, I don't like exams, I have to tell you. But we have to, to perform them in some way. Uh, the exam traditionally for this course is not a written exam, it's an oral exam. Um, the wave physics uh, exam, since it's the first, um, was a written exam, but now it's time to be, how to say, to perform from a, using words and the blackboard. Uh, and let me tell you, an oral exam is much better at the end of the story than a written one. Because in an oral exam, you can erase a blackboard and think and say things again, thinking about them. In a written exam, what is written is written. Here, the future in an oral is unwritten. Of course, you have to know what you're saying and what you're thinking about. So for the oral exam, this material is more than enough. I will never ask you something that is outside these slides, and I will ask you mainly just to think about what we are discussing here. The typical duration of an oral exam about theoretical seismology is between five minutes and half an hour. In five minutes, if you are good enough, that's fine for me. Uh, but okay, jokes apart, let's say it, it will be a sort of a 20, 25 minutes of discussion about the topics that we have here. Um, in practice, if you need um, a sort of a textbook to, 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 as a support, in the wave physics course, uh, I was suggesting Stein and Y session 
uh, an introduction to seismology. It, it has a long title, but it's it's um, okay. I will show it to you if you want later on my Mac. Uh, you have many copies at the ICTP library. There are many copies also at the University Library, at the UNITS library. Um, let me say that you can find a digital version of that book. Uh, and let me add also one other thing, that some of the topics that we are going to cover here are not fully covered inside that book. That book is beautiful. It's uh, very easy to be to be read. It's, it has a lot of access. It's beautiful, but uh, two topics are not fully expanded. And so, to for the folds and body forces for representation theorem, um, these slides here are going a little bit beyond uh, what you can find there. Uh, if you need another textbook, but that's a sort of a very hard textbook. Um, you, you can find all the theory and more, much more than what you need in uh, Aki and Richards. It's called Quantitative Seismology. And there are some copies here also in the ICTP library. But it's really, uh, I guess that half of the seismologists in the world never read it because it's too tough. Um, by the way, let me tell you, what you find in the PDF here is enough. But of course, you can go beyond. You, you will be, you are very welcome to go beyond and to teach me something that is not here. So uh, that's the second uh, practical info that I want to share with you. So here is the material. And what we're going to discuss are the, let's say, Let's call them PowerPoints, but I'm not using PowerPoint. So the slides of that are here on this website. Okay. Um, let me stop sharing the screen here so that let me write one other expression here on my back on this beautiful blackboard. Okay, I know that my writing is terrible, but please tell me, what is that? Come on, guys. What, what? Wave equation. Wave equation. Yes, that's wave equation. I'm sure that with LAPO you spent hours in building it. Yeah, when I was giving wave physics, I spent hours in building this beautiful expression. I love it. You should love it. Now, let's try to add some adjectives to this equation. This is the 1D wave equation. Because it's the simple version because we have just one special variable, x, OK? It's not a 3D wave equation, but it's nice. What is, how would you describe the solutions of this equation? Well. We have one here. My friends, are you the same people that attended the wave physics course? I guess so. This year, I cannot say definitely, but I guess that you are the same people that attended the wave physics course. So, okay, one possible solution could be a beautiful 
harmonic plane wave. You can put a amplitude here and you have a solution. That's called progressive wave. Why? Because when time is passing, the wave that is, and the wave field is made by planes, okay? Okay? And when the time is passing, the perturbation is traveling left or right according to the sign that we have here with the given velocity, right? You agree with me? Okay. What is this? Is it a solution? I don't know where to look. Maybe I have to look here. I think I don't see the full board. Um, I don't see the full board where you wrote. I just saw um, a sign. OK. Yeah, it's not well, covered. The camera is not covered. Doesn't cover the board, so I don't see. You don't you see this write, expression? Yeah, write it at the back, like where you are standing. I think when you write it at the back, you will see it. Well, but I guess that I see what you see in here. Do you see me? Yeah, I see half of you. Oh, so don't you see this part here? Yeah, I see. I see up to. And the amplitude sign into brackets, then I don't see the rest. Yeah. This is K. This is cosine of omega t. Yeah. So do you okay. see? I see the amplitude sign. Sign. Uh -huh. The rest, I don't see them. Oh, from know. here. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. OK. It has come now. I, I did that, nothing. Yeah, I did it nothing. has come now. Okay. Okay. Now that you see it, can you tell me what is that? Um, that's another solution for the wave equation. Okay. Instead of writing this, we can write it in this form too. Okay. How do you call it? You said? How do you call it? This is a progressive wave. This is not because space and time are separated. It's called a standing wave. Now remember, these are both solutions of this equation. And remember that when you take a problem like this one, let me, oh, the choke was, just one second. When you take a problem like that, when you separate the variables and you plug this solution here and you proceed by separating variables, you will get solutions. You can call them eigenfunctions, eigenvalues, separating variables. And this and this are two complementary solutions because you can generate this considering two progressive waves going in opposite direction and their interference can create standing wave. Vice versa, you can separate variables. You plug them here, you find the solution. And then using this, you can write this. This is called the separation of variable approach. And it's called the modal approach. 
they are complementary. Every time that you listen to an MP3 audio file on your telephone or wherever, you're using frequencies and you're using the Fourier theorem. And when you sum single frequencies or harmonics, you can create a beautiful sound then. So remember, this is a complementary vision of wave solutions. Now, given that, my question to you is, Jacobo, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, 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 okay. I was scared because no more image. Okay, now question to you. What is the seismic source or the source in this equation? So if you're listening to an MP3, actually my, my voice is reaching you using this because actually I'm speaking this empty room here now, but it's empty. But the microphone here is going to take the vibration of an acoustic wave. It's transforming it in a series of harmonics. It's sending via Wi-Fi or via cable this information to your speaker or to your headphones, and now you're listening to me. I'm sorry for that. But you know, we are using the Fourier theorem just to speak in this digital world. Now, my question to you is, what is the source in that equation? What is me? No, it's not there. Because this is just the wave equation without any source term. So we can go from 1D to, 3D, to 2D to 3D, whatever. We can include much more complicated um, models. We can add three surfaces. We can add layers. We can do many things here. But still, there is no source term. Why? Because it's difficult. Because Usually, this equation is solved like that. Now you have a beautiful differential operator, and it is telling you, OK, you have a function. You have to compute the time derivative twice. You have to compute the spatial derivative twice. You put the things together, and you have to give me a set of functions that is satisfying that equation when it is equal to zero. Good. The differential equations that we can find are easy because they are similar to the uh, harmonic oscillator equation. We can build them. We can apply the boundary conditions. And to find this, you can uh, consider a vibrating string, a vibrating membrane, a vibrating sphere. But still, there is no source. And now the problem is, what happens when we put a source term there? Oh, my friends, life is getting more complicated there. Maybe for simple terms, like a delta or impulse, we can find the solution. And that problem is called the Green's function. But you can understand that when this term here is more complicated, like an earthquake, situation is becoming much more difficult. So if you want to see this course, 
as a sort of a continuation of a wave physics course, the wave physics course was dealing about the birth and the evolution of a wave equation from a string to uh, sound waves in a room or in empty space, whatever, empty unbounded space, whatever. But this course is trying to deal with sources. That's the problem. And it's really a very complicated problem. So this is what we have to do. Now, uh, I'm spending too much time in, in introduction and creating connections, but I hope that this discussion here is useful for you just to recap thoughts and to use a given perspective, trying to, to understand what we're going to do. Okay, now let me make another experiment. Let me try to share my screen from the Mac so that we can go to the uh, introduction. And let me try to share this part. Uh, okay, do you see it? Yes, okay. yes, you are seeing. Okay, very good. Now, this is my poor email here. So for those of you that have not, has not sent an email to me before, um, so I'm asking to the diploma students to write me so that I can collect your emails. Just put in the uh, T-size uh, and stuff like that. And so I can reply with the uh, site to all of you. I can reply to all of you putting the website of the Moodle at ICDP. And Maria Aurora, we will see. I, I don't think you will be able to connect to the Moodle on ICTP. Okay. But, but we will try. Otherwise, I created a sort of a copy of it on the free Moodle at the university. It's fine. Okay. Yes. Okay. What else? Um, hmm. Okay. That's the email. I will reply to your email with the link. And uh, so we can also have sort of email communication if necessary. Um, what else? Let me show to you the, the two books that I was trying to suggest. Uh, T size, no, not here, but okay. Let's see if I have the, okay. Okay, this is the book that Maybe you have already used for the wave physics. It's called Stein wave session. If you want to have a sort of a shoulder uh, uh, a textbook that you, you can use if you want. Okay. There are many copies here at the ICTP library, and there are some copies also at the uh, university library. But but if you want, you can look for. A, a soft copy of it, but I'm not suggesting any more, any more things here. Okay, so before we start, and that will be very quick in the last, uh, showing to you some, let's say nice, but a little bit simple movies here. Do you have any other practical questions before we proceed? Um. Yes, yeah, sorry for bothering, Professor. Can I ask you? Yes, sure. Yes, it's regarding the book you said because I haven't seen um, the, oh, the text. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, sorry but, because I was sharing only one window of my screen. So let me, okay, let me, sorry. Thank you because I, I was not used to, okay, stop sharing. That is fine. Yeah. No, no, okay, yeah. fine. You can also leave it by the end of the lesson if you want. Ah, oh, okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah, it was on a different window. It's so fine. It. Yes. And here it is. Oh, well, okay, now it's getting old. This book it was new, but now it's getting older, but uh, still very valid. And so, okay. But question for the diploma students, 
I think that you have already used it for some parts of the wave physics. Am I right or am I wrong? Or Lapo just left to you, baby. Okay, by the way, if, if you want to, uh, to have a sort of a um, accompanying book, that's the best. Um, if you want to, just as a hint, I have to look for Viaki and Richards, okay. That's the other one. And it contains all the theory that you can imagine, but just to let you to understand what is the problem that we're going to deal with. Oh, I have to share another window. Wait a second. I want you to be prepared to what we're going to see here. And I'm preparing the right, the proper page. Okay. Okay. That's the, it's a sort of a holy book for theoretical seismology, but I think that no one except the authors uh, actually read all the pages of it. Let me show to you an example. Okay, this is what we're going to study. This is one part of what we call representation theorem. And actually, oh, some strange sound is appearing here. The host is open, breakout room. Wait to be a sound. What's happening here? I don't know. Are you still viewing my screen? Yes. So someone is creating breakout rooms. I don't know what, what's that, but okay. So just to give to you a, an idea of a, how to say, of what you can find inside this textbook is this. This is the representation of theorem in one of the versions. This is the Green's function, and that's the earthquake. Isn't it nice? It's beautiful. Really, it's beautiful. But OK, so we have to go through this sort of the alpine road, try to survive, trying to survive and to, get, to arrive safe at the end of the journey. And the end of the journey is very simple, actually. And you, you will see, we will call it the moment tensor. But this is just to give to you an idea of how beautiful this book can be. So now, and with this, um, after that I'm receiving your, your email, and I will reply with the, with the link that I promised to you, my question now is, OK, um, do you have any other practical question for now, or can we go with the presentation? Fine to go? OK. So now, let me try to, maybe it's, everything is going to explode here, but OK. Let me try to, to see if the animation is starting. OK. Now, that's sharing is post bringing your share with to, to the front. Do you see it? I'm, I'm receiving very strange messages from Zoom here in this room, but I hope you, you do see it. Okay. Now, the question is very simple why do earthquakes happen? And the answer is earthquake dynamics. But to go a little bit deeper with this question here, uh, we will have to wait for the next lecture or web, for next web. And we're going to spend just uh, one hour a doubt about dynamics. But for today, the simple question, the simple answer could be, you can find it on the left. That's a possible answer. <laughs> we are not that far from, from that part. Because Namazu in the old Japanese culture was a giant catfish. But as soon as Kashima, that is a sort of a semi-god uh, with the stone, was distracted, the giant catfish was moving, and the shaking was causing tsunami and earthquakes. OK. Well, the modern um, answer actually could, could use fluid dynamics. Oh, why it's OK. Oh, why it's not OK. It was supposed to be animated, but it's animation is not going there. Bring your shared window to the front. What's happened here? Have you seen the animation? No, I don't think so. Let's see. 
I'm sorry for that. Uh, do you see the new animations? It's post. Sharing is post. Wait a second. Let me try it again because the animation was not there. Okay, now let's see if I. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, now you, you should see the animations in some way. But let me go back to this. So the answer is in fluid dynamics, if you want. But please give a look to this, because this very nice animation is simulating the Navier Stokes equations. But they're not part of seismology, actually, but it's more part of fluid dynamics. And there is a sort of a paradox here. Well, you should know that, OK, we have a crust, the mantle, we have the core of the Earth, and the outer core is fluid. That's fine. But what about the mantle? Is it fluid? My friends, the question is to you. Now, let's try to keep strong for 23 minutes. And let's try to be on the move here. My question to you is, what about the mantle, not the outer core? Is it fluid? The tile, <laughs> maybe. Well, OK. <laughs> yes, you're right. But actually, if you want to distinguish between a fluid and a solid, you should see if S waves can propagate there. Because S waves do not propagate into fluids, let's say ideal fluids. So, but we have S waves in the mantle. So it's solid. And we can study the crust, the lithosphere, <laughs> the asthenosphere, and whatever. So it should be solid. But in this animation here, Actually, it's moving like a fluid. And these are Navier-Stokes equations. Well, please remember that what is really different here is the time scale. Because these are millions of years. And on such a long time scale, also the rocks and the mountains behave like fluids because actually it's a ductile flow. And to define what is ductile or brittle, Everything depends about rheology and time scales. So actually, when we are studying the Earth from a seismological point of view, actually, we're considering brittle material, because an earthquake is happening, is occurring in brittle material. But let's remember, uh, let's remember that the, actually the dynamo, the engine, on very long time scale is fluid. And so the dynamics that are going, that are at the, how to say, at the base of tectonics on very long time scales are very different. So our sources, the earthquake, that is the main topic of this course here, uh, actually occurs because the, the Earth is dynamic. And its dynamics should be written in terms of Navier-Stokes equations. So you should say, oh, well, come on. Uh, Navier-Stokes equations are studied in a fluid dynamics or fluid mechanics course. And this course is called seismology. But please remember that dynamics are changing according to the point of view and the time scale that you're going to adopt. If you're going to study geodynamics, well, you can say that the Earth is, well, a sort of a ductile fluid or a ductile solid. There are no borders. What I'm trying to say is that actually earthquakes are part of this very complicated and beautiful engine that is our Earth. And this was another animation with, with a different layer. Let's go now to a different spatial and time scale. From millions of years, let's say, thousand of years. And now in the tectonic motions, we can have 
divergent zones or subduction zones, where we have a sort of a game between the accumulation of stress energy and kinetic seismic energy, or also gravity energy. So it's a game that is similar to what a violin player is doing with the bow and the strings. Because actually, what a violin player, if he or she is using a bow, is doing what we call stick and slip. So you have a stick part, well, friction are going to resist against the motion, and you're going to accumulate potential energy. And then you have a slip phase, and part of that energy is released. Not with the beautiful melody of a, of a violin, but with the, well, maybe not so beautiful melody of an earthquake cycle. Because friction is causing, in many cases, potential energy to be accumulated. Which one? Elastic. Elastic energy. And when the gain between friction and the forces that are acting against friction are winning, then we have a slip. So if we go now on a shorter time scale than million of years, we can see that the part of the Earth system is solid, is brittle, and it can create fractures, or it can resist the sliding on existing fractures, and that's the stick phase of a game, and after that, a slip is coming. Remember, there is another nice animation on a different time scale, on a shorter one, and you have a stress building at the junction between plates, and then sometimes the friction is losing, and then you have a slip. It's a sudden slip, and seismic waves are generated. So in this balance of energy, that is uh, internal balance of the Earth due to the tectonic motions, well, million of years, hundreds of thousands of years, thousands of years, and then maybe one minute, we have a sudden release of sleep. We have a rupture process. And this is what we're going to study here, and we're going to represent it. Well, this animation is similar to the other one. It's a subduction zone. But why I'm putting it here? Because, well, you can set this deformation on when you're lucky, when you have GPS, when you have enough time to study it, and well, you can study the deformation on long time scale, let's say years. And you will see that the deformation will take place. And you can imagine that maybe in a very large subduction, subduction zone, GPS is going to record this deformation here that is gentle, it's charging, and then we have a sudden release. And if this sudden release is occurring at the, at the subduction zone, maybe you have also a oceanic trench there. And you, if you have water on the top, well, part of the energy is going to be converted also in gravitational potential energy and then kinetic energy, and so tsunami. So seismic and tsunami waves. This is what we're going to study in this course. Now, let, let me, I will be very quick here because this part of the, these topics will be better covered by Karim in his course. And if you want to, to now to take a sort of a different vision, what's occurring over faults or fault systems, well, you have to imagine you can create a sort of a analog, mechanical analog. You can take a brick under gravity. You, you can take a, a surface that has some friction of it. You can apply a force and you can try to pull the brick. Well, the competition between the friction of a plane with the normal component of a weight and the pulling action, well, it will give a stick version here and a slip, stick, slip. And now it seems that, well, such kind of cycle can be easily studied. Well, also this simple machine here 
can become immediately complex when, for example, you consider this kind of system here and you're going to couple bricks. And now you're, oh, okay, let me try to stop it here. Okay. So you're accumulating energy in one of them with your pool. So the pool could be the tectonic force. Um, the game of friction here could be the friction of a rheology of a, of a lithosphere here. Now you're pulling, you're accumulating potential energy and suddenly you will have a slip, maybe of a red brick. Okay. But here you need some time because the potential energy has to, to accumulate on this side here. And so, well, wait, no, not that one. Okay, this one. And so now the red cycle and the blue cycle are connected. And since we have feedback there, it's a chaotic system. So also in this simple analog of stick and slip, we can imagine that on short time scales and on, how to say, on both systems here, what we call cycle is not easy to be studied because it's, we cannot find a period there because we, will, we have many interactions. And so the dynamics here can be very, actually they are very complicated. So if you want to use a sort of the time axis that is saying us what is the geological time that is running there, we can imagine the stress building. So that stick, then slip, then stick, then slip. Now, if all the ingredients of this recipe here are known and they are not, because we don't know actually what is the pulling force, we don't know the friction low over the single folds and actually they are interconnected. So we will never have a beautiful pseudo deterministic behavior here, but actually reality is much more similar to this cartoon here where you have stress accumulation and slip release on different fold systems in a sort of a unpredictable way. Well, of course we can say uh, the plate borders that will be the place where the earthquakes will happen. But please remember that when the cycle, the word cycle is letting you think that, okay, we, we can do some near term prediction. Well, we can't. And to conclude this introduction, uh, that, is, that is not my cup of tea, but I want to show you just what you're going to discuss in Karim's course, something like that but also for very simple theoretical systems like what we call the rate and state friction low, you can have beautiful theory and beautiful models to play with. Also, this is an example, this is the Ruina low, and you're going to discuss with Karim, just to remember, don't close the doors between courses because we're going to speak about earthquakes, but not, we will not go deeper, for example, in this topic here, so about friction lows, we will assume it, we will use a very simple friction law, the simplest one, uh, you can call it the Coulomb uh, friction law, and you will see, we will see together on the next lecture, but please remember that in other courses, you can study much more complicated than realistic models like this one. So this slide here, just to, to show to you, okay, if you, you, can, you can also take a course in theoretical seismology and theoretical dynamics of earthquakes and you, you you will spend months there but not with me okay so this is um, a door opened on a different course now another animation here to show you uh, using just a movie that actually what we're going to call an earthquake and at the end of the story we will assume it will be a point acting in some time somewhere, well, actually, the history could be much more complicated because it will be a stress imbalance. Why well, it's not starting here? Uh oh, I'm sorry. A movie was supposed to play here. Okay, now you see it. Okay. Now, what is this? Let me stop. Okay. Sorry, but th there is a delay between the animation. Okay. Now, 
Another door opened more on the Karim scores. Actually, what you see here is a fault model, very simple one, it's a plane. Rupture is going to start somewhere and you have a stress unbalance that is propagating on a fault plane. And so this is a stress. It's a model, it's a beautiful model. This is the rupture. And what I want to say to you since now is that an earthquake is dynamically and kinematically something that could be very complex. And it's not a point, it's not an instantaneous source. It could take time. Of course, it will be a time, and you will see, I hope, the animation at the end of today's lecture of the Tohu event, that is the event, the seismic event, that usually I'm using after March 2011 um, as a sort of a skeleton of a course showing to you some very re relatively recent results and to show to you the topics that we're going to cover. You will see that the rupture that occurred on the magnitude nine Toku event of March 11, 2011, actually the rupture was lasting more than two minutes. I'm not speaking about the waves, I'm speaking about the rupture. And it was occurring on a fault that was, let's say, 1,000 kilometers long. So it's not a point, it's not an instant. So let's keep that in mind. Um, another thing that I, let's see if I can, okay, move this here, okay. And one other message that I want to give to you is that when you have fault systems like this, this is a piece of a North Anatolian fault. Every time that you have a, an event there, you have a dynamic communication with other parts of a fault system. So once that an event occurs, you're redistributing the stress in other parts, creating shadows or lights that, of course, can will cause other parts of the fault system to move in the future. So the main message in this series of movies here is that please let's remember the time scales. Million of years, thousands of years, seconds, minutes, hours, or tens of years here are giving different views of what we can call seismic sources. From today on, we will take the point of view of a single event. And we will make it so simple that at the end of the story, it will be a point with a duration of pretty much nothing. But please remember that it is not. And to, to use that approximation that will be very, how to say, useful to be introduced in the wave equation, well, okay, we have to be careful about the different approximation that we are going to take. Now, let me spend, again, some time and the final the, the end part of this lecture, just to show to you some uh, snapshots of the information that we have been getting from the Toku event. I'm referring to the March 2011. Okay, situation is, from the point of view of the formation, is one of the most active zones in the world from a seismic point of view. Um, actually, we have to speak here about rate of convergence, and I like to now to create a bridge, a conceptual bridge with the course by Alessandro Borghi. So the study of deformation here and talking in terms of rate of a convergence, so a distance over a time, well, it's pretty much fast. So let's say approximately nine centimeters per year. Well, you could say, well, well that's low, but it's one, it's very fast. For example, in the Alpine belt, we have one order of a magnitude less velocities, velocity of deformation, of course. But relatively speaking, this is a fairly high convergence rate. And this abduction zone is very seismically active. So what was going there in this cartoon prepared by, by Roger Billam, who visited the SCP a few years ago? Well, okay, we have a Pacific plate, it's a very complicated zone, but dynamically, we have a subduction zone that is locked somewhere 
and we are accumulating stress. Okay. And during the accumulation of the stress here, this is Bessendaya, so it's a city that is let's say, here. We have a gentle deformation, but preparing for an event. How do you see that this is a very seismically active zone? For example, looking at these two animations, they should, let me try to start them. I'm scared, but okay. Now, on the left, you see the seismicity of Japan in, let's say, 30 years. We have a lot of events of sequences leaving a lot of beautiful colors on the map you will see at the end when it will stop at 2011. And this is the proof that it is really seismically active zone. This is, if you want, the study of distribution of space and time of seismic events is called seismicity, the study of seismicity. And what you can see on the left then is that it's very active. Uh, those are very bad news, of course, because it means that you are feeling a lot of events. Uh, the good news is that in some way you are prepared to them, because there are some places where the rate of convergence is much slower, and actually maybe a large event, and large, we will try to quantify, to quantify what is large and what is not, well, it occurs maybe every 200 years, and you're losing the culture of preparedness to an event. Okay, on the right here, are starting? It's just a few days of a sequence. Look, on the top, it's 9 March, you see here. After the sequence, we can call this, this was a foreshock. And it was a magnitude eight for sure. So it was impressive to everyone. And then sequence, sequence, then the main event, March 11, and then all the aftershocks. What I'm saying here is that it's a very active zone. And at the end of the story, one of the first piece of information that we could get, let's say in, on average in hours, after the main event, this is what we could get. Now, to understand this, and this is called the centroid moment tensor solution uh, made by bulletins, made by some agencies. Uh, for example, this one was the one produced by CMT, and the other one was the um, released by um, the United States Geological Survey. Uh, just a few hours after the event, this piece of information was circulating. Now, what you see depicted in these two balloons that we can call beach balls, well, these are the focal mechanisms. And the parameters that are here reported, they are called moment tensor components. This is an important piece of information, and this is what we're going to study after the representation theorem. Now, going from this piece of information to signals, what you can study after the event using GPS, and this is a bridge to Alessandro Borghi's course, well, what you can see here, for example, in this piece here, look at this is the Japanese coast, this is the place where the sequence occurred, look at the GPS here. You see, GPS means that you're measuring displacement using satellites, of course. And look at the components here. So it was quiet in this part. The transient, that's the earthquake. Now look at this tilt here. It's permanently tilted. Well, that is called co-seismic displacement or co-seismic slip. You're going to study it with Alessandra and Karim, but we will perform the theory that is at the base of its, of its understanding. And we will need the Green's function. So I'm showing to you very rapidly here some images, just to let you understand, I hope, how important will be the theory that we're going to develop into this course, also if it is happy. So what you are calling co-seismic slip, we will call it the near-field term. 
And you can create these maps here. And this is the map that has been produced thanks to the very dense GPS network that was available in Japan in 2011. And you see these arrows here showing the permanent deformation that occurred after the event. And I look at the slip here, these are meters, tens of meters. So actually after the earthquake, the rebound, what we can call the rebound, the elastic rebound, moved permanently part of Japan until here, okay, by meters down and towards the sea. This is called co-seismic slip. Now going to a different vision, I look also at GPS waveforms that are now no more a boundary between geodesy and seismology, actually GPS uh, signals are used by seismologists and people working in geodesy. Looking at the displacement, what you notice here and on this sequence of, uh, let's say, these six signals, look at how different some of them are. Look at these three here. You see, okay, before the event, the event, waves are passing, and then you have a permanent deformation here. Permanent, permanent. These are centimeters, so these are, okay, more than 10 meters. Three components of motion, two horizontal, and one vertical. And what you can see here, that more far you move from this zone here, look at this two, for example, or this in the top. Well, actually, this permanent displacement is no more there. And that's why we will call it near field term. And one of the purposes of this course, uh, I hope, is to provide you a way to define or to understand better what is near field and far field. Now, this is a normal displacement, what you were waiting for a recording. So quiet, transient, quiet again, but here, the new quiet state is permanently deformed from the initial equilibrium. That's why it's called near field or co-seismic displacement. And that's a map, okay. Let me go to the signals here. Now going towards the ground motion, so the typical seismological signature, now you can see the signals recorded by a GPS and compared to the low pass filtered recordings from accelerometers, because the Japan seismic networks are where and are very dense. So they had, they had a lot of signals there. And you see how the GPS and the ground motion signal are pretty much the same. And I want to show to you that there is no boundary, uh, no, no clear boundary between geodesy and seismology when you use a GPS. Going to the ground motion, let's give a look to this. Uh, I think this two will not work. Let's see. No. Okay. Uh, sorry, these two animations are not working. But what I I will do my best to, to show to you. Uh, maybe I can do one thing here. We're pretty much finished for today. Don't worry. But uh, okay, I will show to you later. Okay. Duration of the ground motion in the Japanese islands. And now this is the seismic wave field propagating, being amplified in sedimentary basins here. And look at the duration. Different time scales. We started from millions of years, the dynamics of the ductile earth. My internet connection is unstable. Can I do that? OK. Um, and now the wave propagation, the seismic wave propagation along the Japanese um, archipelago, okay, it was lasting six minutes. Please look on how here the duration of the motion was longer, and that was due to the um, local amplification made by the impedance contrast between the sedimentary um, materials that are here compared to the rocky part. And so here it was long lasting. This is the ground animation. This is one of the maps that were produced after the passage of a wave field. The Japanese network is so dense that 
with a lot of recordings. And this is a map that is joining the study of seismology to engineering because this is a map that can be used for hazard. It's called PGD. What does it mean? Peak ground displacement. You can create a map of the peak ground of the displacement left on the ground after the wave passage. Please notice that this uh, hotspot here that was a recording and displacement more, it's a transit, more than one meter. Uh, some beautiful waveforms collected along the coast of Japan. And I'm showing this to you. Sorry, I want you to now to go a little bit faster, but this was just a prequel to let you to understand that whenever you're going to study seismic ground motion, you have to remember that you can use acceleration, velocity, or displacement. Now, this is the same signal, but studied in acceleration domain and displacement domain. And of course, you see the difference. Acceleration, since it is twice um, differentiating, you, you can obtain acceleration, of course, twice differentiating the, the displacement domain, you are enriching it of high frequency. If you think about the expression that I was writing before for the harmonic wave, e to i omega t minus kx, every time that you differentiate respect to time, you're getting down omega. So the signal in your acceleration is much richer in high frequencies than the displacement. Look also how beautiful it was different in this part here. And you can see how the rupture was complex here with at least two wave trains arriving pretty much together. This is a signature of the rupture process that was occurring there. And if you give a look to the recordings along the Japanese coast here, look how different they appear because the signals here appearing there, the first part of the rupture was almost not recorded here, as you can see here. And another map that is widely used and may be abused to um, indicate the hazard is what is called PGA. And PGA stands for peak ground acceleration. And if you give a look to this map here, it's impressive because in this hotspot, the PGA there recorded was more than 3G. Now, G is an important unit because it's used by engineers and I'm working with engineers pretty much every day. And they like to use G as a unit for acceleration because when they design buildings, the first section that they're using to design is the building itself, not to self-collapse. And of course, it's under the gravity force. And so 1G is an important limit. Well, the recording that was, um, okay, the thing that was recording there and I will show to you just a brief snapshot, was more than 3G. Let me show it to you. This is the signal. And if you give a look here, it's this is more than 3G. And one of the questions could be, wow. So in Tsukidate, that is the city where the recording was obtained, you're going to wait for total destroy there. Well, actually, pretty much nothing occurred because actually, this peak ground acceleration occurred at very high frequencies. So that tiny details of the buildings were damaged, but not the structures themselves. So another message that I want to give to you in this pretty much ending introduction is, please remember that theoretical seismology can be used and is used, especially nowadays, also for some applications that are going toward seismic hazard. And what you're looking here, but we will discuss it just in the final lecture, is what we can call the response spectra. And the response spectra here is used by engineers uh, with seismic codes. Okay, final slides here. And then we can join back to what you have studied in wave physics. Now moving from the recordings nearby or around the source, so in Japan, if you move along and you follow, if you want to trace the um, wave field around the world, and now the world is a sphere, well, oblate spheroid, 
you can record the wave field at the antipode position. You know it is going to take, let's say, 90 minutes to go on the other side of the world. Then it's going to cross it again, and then it's going back to the source. And then if the source is strong enough, and this was very strong because the magnitude was nine, well, you can have surface wave waves that can interfere and excite in the three modes of the Earth. And that was one of the pieces of information that can be used to study the source. And using the wave fields collected around the world, we can do some other inversions. And this is one of the topics that we are going to describe in this course here. So a finite fold model. This was the result of an inversion using the ground motion recording around the world and doing an inversion process about the rupture process, you see, modeling waveforms and inverting one of the first pictures of a rupture that occurred on the fold that generated the Tohoku event. Well, this is an image of a slip on the fold. This is one of our targets, a fold, a rupture process with its kinematics and with the rupture front leaving the slip on the fold. This is our target. That's why I'm showing this to you. I want to, to provide you the tools necessary to understand this picture. And to conclude, this is the animation of the rupture time made by Jim Mori. This is the rupture. These are not the waves. If you want, it's a stress wave, but using the recorders around the world, they inverted it for the rupture process. And now you see how the rupture started, moved to the north, stopped there, and decided to continue back to the south with a very complicated rupture process, now releasing much more high frequency. And at the end of the story, the rupture was lasting more than two minutes. That's the rupture. So one of the final messages is, OK, when we're going to study the focal mechanism, the earthquake will become a point and maybe an instant. It's not. So remember that we can and we should always think in terms of the finite source. Um, final animation using uh, US array. And usually I'm using this animation to, um, to explain the three modes of the Earth, but the recording of the waves and in US. This is Rayleigh wave. These are the body phases. Rayleigh wave is arriving here. And later, the wave field will arrive on the other side. Look here. And so we have surface waves arriving from one side, surface waves arriving from the other side, interference, the modes of the Earth. And the modes of the Earth, please remember, are the longest period vibrations that we can study. I'm sure that I can ask you, what is the duration of S02? But I'm scared to ask you at this hour because you want to have lunch. So the answer is 54 minutes. That's the longest period of vibration of the Earth. Now, is there something longer? Yes, tsunami. And this is one of the final topics I hope that we are going to cover. And now I want to conclude this mess introduction with this. Look at this animation, please, because now we will have another time scale. So the time scale for that event was, OK, a couple of minutes for the rupture to start and to be completed. Six minutes for the waves to propagate across Japan. 90 minutes to go across the world and to interfere in hours. But then, suddenly, another transient was started by that event, gravity waves, fluid dynamics, but earthquake-induced. And since they are gravity waves and they are relatively slow compared to the seismic waves, OK, now we have a different time. No more than six minutes necessary for the seismic wave field to work across Japan. But now we need, OK, you will see 20, 40 minutes for the waves to arrive to the coast. 
event to interfere. 40 minutes. It's a very long time. And if you want to study the propagation of a tsunami across the ocean, <clears throat> going to be American coasts, it will take, let's say, 24 hours. So please remember that to, if you want to have long period information about an event, you have only two ways. Well, three. The three modes of the Earth, that's the number one. Two, tsunami, when we are excited, because they are long period waves. And the third, and that is the, maybe the most important, is the static displacement left in the near field. Because the static displacement, in principle, it has infinite period. And we will see that when we will study the uh, source spectra, that is one of the most important topics of this course. So let me conclude with this animation here, showing, again, different time scales. So 40 minutes, hours for the tsunami wave field to reach the coast of Japan, 24 hours to reach the American coasts. So we started from a million of years, we have been to seconds, minutes, now hours. Please keep this in mind. Okay, uh, my friends, I'm sorry because I've been late uh, by 15 minutes. I've not been Japanese in this. Okay, sorry for that, but I wanted to conclude this introduction. Um, from WED, we will do something different. We will enter more slowly in the proper topics of the course. First, we will speak about dynamics, but it will be sort of a glance that you, and you will um, go deeper with Karim. And then we will start our kinematics um, path, considering the representation theorem, the Green's function problem, and then the focal mechanisms, then the seismic attenuation, and then some words about seismic and tsunami hazard. So that's the plan of this course. Okay. Um, so, okay, let me <clears throat> stop my sharing here. Uh, okay, um, this lecture was also messy because we spent some time in knowing each other and also trying to recap some, some topics that we are going to use and reuse in this course. Um, so it's time for me to say you goodbye.